Right, so yeah, so welcome to the uh, third session of the day. It's all about people, uh, chaired by Edward Richardson, and I'll, I'll hand you over to Edward. Okay. Right, uh, I'm Edward Richardson. I'm uh, would you like the mic like to stand that. or um, okay, take a mic, sir? Right, um, I work as a uh, farm advisor with Farm Cornwall. Farm Cornwall is a charity which was set up 21, yeah, year, 21 years ago to help farmers who find themselves in difficulty. We have now spread right from West Penwith right the way through the county. Um, and I would say, without, without a doubt, behind every difficulty that we see, people are, is that there's a people problem behind that, whether it's an issue of mental health, whether it's an issue of succession, whether it's an issue of family relationships, or, or even a lot more isolation. We may have looked in the past and seen pictures of Lots of people working on farms, well, that's not the case today. There's very, you was sat in your tractor, you come home, you go, you, you, and, that, and that's it. You often, I remember a couple of instances um, whereby we sat in a, a kitchen, the farmer had decided to um, give up milking. Um, we're looking at um, uh, how, how we could replace that income that he lost from from the milking income and we looked at well maybe somebody else could actually milk those cows their cows on his farm we could potentially convert some of the farm buildings his loneliness was that his wife went out to work his children were teenage children and like a lot of teenage children they just grunt and they don't talk to you and he and he was lonely and we thought we we think we'd sorted it all out and and then we were sat in the kitchen and uh, his wife and another lady were in the kitchen at the same time uh, in, the, in the other part of the house and he said, do you see that lady with my wife? I think that's, my go that's her girlfriend. Do you think you can sort that out as well? <laughs> so, um, which I said no. <laughs> um, I think the other, particularly working with staff, is you need to have a good relationship with your workers. And having been a farm worker myself and then a farm manager and, and now a farm advisor, is, is the mental stress. I remember another instance of a farmer um, whose communication skills were not brilliant, telling we were, it was quite a stressful particularly situation. And he said, oh, said to the farmer, go and get some gates, we need some gates, we need some so-and-so gates. And then he got these gates, and then the farmers, the farm workers just standing there. So why are you doing nothing? You know, you need to get on and do something. So his communication skills all the time, this is stressful. That, he would not, that, that person didn't have very good English skills either. And it was just that, just working with that person and expecting them to do a bit more than just the job you just gave them. On the humorous, on the more humorous side, I, in a job I asked as a farm manager, was we had a, a young man working for us who was uh, a little bit, um, he was special needs. And I asked him to go and bury a sheep when you were allowed to bury sheep. And um, he came back and said, oh, Everett, I've done it, I've done it. So I said, well, let's go and have a look at it. And the two feet were just stuck up out the ground <laughs> like two daffodils. <laughs> so I asked him to dig it over again. Um, I think what, one more comment um, is... That I had to get in, attend a conference not long ago and there was concern was the amount of work that farmers were doing themselves and the amount of time they were able to spend with their family. And one farmer said, I put as much in as I can to the farm and whatever free time I have, I have to spend it with my family. And I would just like the ability to go and have a pint with my friends, to go than watch the pirates, just to have that time. And I don't have that time. So now I'd like to introduce, we have Chris Knoll, who farms a dairy farm at Trink and also has uh, some uh, uh, development of his own, selling his own milk privately through uh, to local cafes. Um, James Richard, who farms at uh, Peace, a beef and contracting farm. Chris Caldwell, NFU, uh, um, Tenants Committee, and also as a dairy farmer as well, and um, Ian Flindula, who runs a very diversified business not that far away. So I'll pass you on to Chris first. 
Okay. Um, I'll sit down, if you don't mind. Um, I think most of you know me. I'm Chris Cardell. Um, in the book, I'm down as Ed Buckland. So if I piss any of you off or say something that upsets you, <laughs> I'm Ed Buckland, and his, de his contact details are in, in, in the leaflet. Um, Ed, Ed sends his apologies. Um, he couldn't make it today, but uh, we, Ed chairs the uh, local RABI, Cornwall RABI fundraising committee, and the wife and I have been on there for a number of years. He's asked me to come down, and then all of a sudden everybody said, well, can you talk on this, can you talk on that? So it's going to be a little bit of, little bit of everything. Um, so f from the RABI side, um, it's um, something we've been involved in, and I and I don't think it matters which of the charities um, you support or, or, or all of them within the agricultural industry, because I think we, within the agricultural industry, we are really lucky that we have, you know, the, the key, key charities of RABI, Addington, FCN, um, and, all the, uh, and the other two or three that, that fit in as well. But they all talk to each other, and virtually all of the money comes from our own industry. There's very little money comes in from outside. We're actually damn good at supporting those of us within the industry that are in trouble. So I don't think it matters which you, you support. But just to give you a, just a few um, figures, just to give you what sort of comes into the county, Cornwall is always a receiver of funds um, from the RBI. We do our very best, and those of you that support us help us immensely. Um, but um, I think the figures up until the end of November um, for 22 was £194,000 worth total spending grants, uh, and that's not including spending on mental health support in this county. Now, we, we raise a, you know, a good number of thousands in this county, but we don't get anywhere near that, so uh, we are a receiver in this county, and it just goes to show um, what the challenges are. Just to, sort of a, at a national point, um, the RIBI helped 253% more farming people and families than they did in 21. So just to show, okay, that that's COVID's going to be quite a bit of that line in there, but it just shows where it's going. And then with all the challenges that are coming down the road, and we talked a little bit this morning about some of our smaller farms that are going to be really challenged. Um, I think, you know, the charities are, are going to be well supported um, and well needed within the county. And just sort of give you a heads up. Um, I don't think it's hit press yet, but, but just between us. Um, we've been very lucky to be picked as one of the joint um, charities for Royal Cornwall Show this year as well. So um, hopefully that will help us boost the thing. So you'll probably see us around. I know many of you supported our um, charity auction that Ed and his team put together uh, at the show, and that raises many thousands each year. Um, and I know you've, you've done a bit of a star turn there as well on that one as well. So uh, thanks for all of you, and thanks for your support. So that's a little bit around the RIBI um, and the sort of mental health work that they're doing. Ourselves, um, we're on our third county council small holding uh, at Probus. We started on a part-time uh, 50 acre unit over at Mitchell. We were then uh, lucky enough to move uh, to a neighbor dairy holding uh, at Mitchell, spent a number of years there. Uh, and then we're, we're now down at Probus and being there, we're now going into our 18th year down at Probus. Um, when we started, <laughs> I'm looking down the road now because your dad has a lot to answer for our, how our sort of progression has gone because your dad was on the council uh, when we moved farms and was very supportive. Uh, um, you know, he's been a big lead, was a big lead to us through YFC days and also through Arla representation as well. Um, I can remember some uh, quite rotorous Arla meetings um, in this country and abroad, but we won't go there. Um, but we, we've, we've moved to, into Probus, um, and that, that was slightly, I think, what um, you were just saying about the down farm lanes. Our, our, our second holding was down a farm lane. It was a mile, mile long lane. It was quite a decent dairy unit, and, and it, st it still is. Uh, our children were at school at the time. Um, like everybody, we had to find an alternative income, so the wife went out to work. And I was the one that was at home. I was the one down that lane um, all the time. So I, I could relate to what you were saying there with, with one of your last um, talks there. Um, and I think a lot of us down farm lanes f find that. So um, the chance came along for us to, to move down to Probus. And um, the 
previous tenants had just started um, a diversification there of a, a, a boarding kennels in Cattery. And I think, in essence, um, they started it out with, with great venture, but for a lot of us as farmers, we don't do people very well. And I think that's where they, they struggled. They found that the, um, the next generation coming on especially weren't interested in doing the people side of things. Uh, and they moved on to a larger holder and, and been very successful as, as they moved away um, and found their line another. So we were actually approached by the land agent at the time um, because the wife was in retail uh, and they had highlighted that this farm needed somebody with, with retail skills. Um, and it was, it was a challenge at the time because we were, as you can imagine, those number of years ago, right at the early stages of a diversification. Um, so you go along to the bank and um, you talk about trying to buy some cows. They knew all about that. But trying to talk about diversifications there wasn't a box to tick at that time. Now, <laughs> that's the first thing they ask you, how are you going to bring in alternative income? But at that time, there wasn't a box. So we, we had to change banks um, to move uh, and all of those sort of hassles. So how times have changed and how the emphasis has changed on, on our businesses. Um, but yeah, no, we've, we've grown that since we've been there. Um, we now have over 4,000 customers throughout Cornwall, um, many of those even from, from down here as well. Uh, they will travel. Um, during COVID, you can imagine that side of the business was, was dead quiet. Um, but last year, everybody wanted to go on holiday, so that was almost as big a headache as, as the year before because we were having to disappoint everybody. But uh, so that, that's that's a nice little add-in. Um, I know today this this sort of topic is around around sort of people. So within that side of the business, we we tended to bring in. Um, students, um, many of those that have gone on to run their own businesses um, um, elsewhere, and also to um, many of you know our daughter and son-in-law, um, Will Curtis and Jess, uh, run the Curtis Contractors down here. Um, they actually started that up from from our holding it as well. So, um, sort of moving on with my NFU tenant forum hat on, as you said. Um, when I go to the meetings at London and everybody says, and especially within the council as well, well, well you've been on three farms and you haven't moved. Um, we have tried. We've, we've not been successful because, like somebody was saying earlier on, there, there aren't many opportunities come up to move, but we tried. But um, the way I turn it around is, well, what is that holding delivered while we've been there? Uh, so we provided our family with, with a business. Jess and Will grew their business from there, gone on to be very successful where they are. We've had four other people that have uh, gone on to start their own businesses as well. Plus, we are providing a service for over 4,000 people within, within, okay, 80% probably come within a 20 mile radius. So no, we haven't moved off. So we don't tick the box to say that the county farms has gone in the old style of looking at it, but that county farm has delivered a hell of a lot for the neighborhood. Uh, and business. So it's one of the things that we've tried to, or I've tried to argue when I've been um, up at um, County Hall or, or even uh, sort of moving on some sort of tenant forum work. Um, I was asked to say a, a few words on that. Um, County Farms has always been a strong um, th thing for me um, and also to, I've, that has been slightly um, my way of release and meeting people, getting to know people. It's something to do off the farm, um, and it does involve the old pint or pasty, as you were saying earlier on. Um, but it, it, it is really interesting, and I would encourage any of you that get a chance to take on a, a, um, a representative role to take that chance, whoever it's with. Um, I can remember within our sort of um, tenant work, we meet up with the institutional landlords on, on a regular basis. And the first meeting I, I uh, had to go to was at Buckingham Gate to meet with the uh, Dutchy land agents. Um, and we sat down, uh, it's quite a, it's, it's reasonably grand, grand room, uh, their offices. Um, and we sat down there and the, the chief agent said, well, I've, I've cleared my diary. He said, we, we can talk about anything. He said, but he put his one phone down. He said, that phone's got to stay on. So we hadn't more than just sat there. Uh, and this phone goes off. He said, oh, I've got to go out. So out, out he goes. And the, the assistant agent says, no, he said, that's the boss on the phone. Um, he said, that's the only one that he, he will go out the room for. And that just sort of gives an emphasis. You know, that was when he was the, um, you know, the duchy uh, and has now gone on to be king. But he was out of the room for 20 minutes. And when he came back in, 
um, the agent said no. He said he's going out on a rural visit tomorrow. He said he's not visiting any farms. He said we don't have any farms in the area, but he said he will not go out unless he's fully briefed and he knows something about the region uh, and how to approach people there. So it just gives an insight as to what the, how, the, how they work, but it has been really interesting. Um, and I sort of thank, I know, I hope a number of you in the room have just completed our tenant survey um, within the NFU, and that's, that's throwing up some interesting ones. We had some discussions this morning around um, tenancies and, and how people were building their businesses around, around that. But I think um, Ed Humber's in, in, in the room, and I'm sure he'll... We only did this just before Christmas, and Ed's just taken over as county um, advisor, and I'm sure he'll be... Uh, making more use of that, that survey going forward, but just to pick out one example in there, and it's one I want to sort of drive home to everybody, is the, the number of businesses that don't have a legal document. We had nearly 30% are either on a rolling tenancy agreement, a family arrangement, or no document at all. That's great, but we all know families don't always do always agree uh, going down the line and it does put a business at, 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 a, at a challenge so if there's one thing i would take out is is building businesses make sure it's secure uh, and you've got some paperwork because even with agents um you know we get on very well with our agents but uh, they don't they don't always stay very long and the next one might not be so kind as the one you've got now so uh, that's a little bit about who we are uh, and, uh, and hopefully it's put out some feelers there for some questions later on thanks everybody Mervyn, he's unable to come, so his father Ian is coming to <laughs> Well, thank you, Edward. It's telling that Mervyn's not here because the pressure on the farm at the moment means he couldn't make it. And at the last minute, he threw his father in. <laughs> so I'm, I apologise for poor preparation. Um, I'm always a bit diffident in a, in a meeting like this amongst all you farmers. I was 50 before I had any dealings with the farm and I'm still learning. Um, Chaprais Farm is 70 acres clean, 70 acres rough on the cliffs at, on the north coast, Malva. In 1841, the census tells us there were 53 people living there. One farming family, two farm labouring families, two servants, a mining family and a miller's family. When my mother-in-law um, finally gave up the farm, she was the last person on it. Now, my introduction to the farm came with my wife that I met at college in 1973 uh, in Portsmouth. As you can tell from my, my voice, I'm not Cornish. I'm a London lad. And when my mother-in-law met me, she wasn't that keen on this hippie um, so I've had to wait. Um, but I did see the farm in its operation. She had 40 milking cows and the followers. And um, grew enough fodder to keep the cows going over the winter. She employed a farm hand. She could have the hod uh, odd holiday. She sent her daughter to private school. And it wasn't a bad life. When it came to us much later on, the buildings were derelict, there was no machinery, no stock, and no hope of making any money, enough to live on, at least, from 40 cows. So there's a kind of a, a, a potted history there as to how farming seems to have changed through the ages, from something that that could support lots of people in a reasonable lifestyle to a, a real um, difficult uh, thing to try and do. We, when we took it over, had one shaft of inspiration which was, well, maybe people want to know where their food has come from, how it's reared, what's the wel welfare of the animals involved like. 
So we thought, well, maybe we could get a premium from producing locally and selling to local people and building up a, a customer, customer base. We didn't know much about rearing animals, so we started with pigs. And we developed a saddleback pedigree herd. Outdoor grown, of course, because that's what people expect from a welfare system. Turns out to be a very difficult way of rearing pigs, but that's what we do. Um, and the other thing that came along was Natural England, who approached us nicely and asked us if we would manage the cliffs in a way to bring back the chuff. So we entered into a high-level stewardship agreement, which is a bit ironic since we knew nothing about farming really, a high-level stewardship agreement to manage the scrub, um, burn it, control it, graze it so that some dung goes on the ground, so that the dung produces larvae, so that the, the chuff have got something to eat. And 12 years later, uh, the, the chuff are back. So what seemed like a pipe dream at the time has actually turned out quite, quite positive. Um, and, and as an aside, I might say that the approach from the natural England then seems to be rather different to current situations, but we'll leave that aside. Um, the idea of producing food for local people meant that we needed to get some training, so I sent my son off to be a butcher. We invested some money in a butchery, and thanks to Lisa, I might say, who put us in the contact with a, a grant, uh, an EU grant. Those EU grants are quite hard work, I might add. Um, but we've ended up with a, a butchery in amongst our farmstead, which is the central hub of our operations. Um, um, and we, 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 of course, that means that some of us have got to learn how to sell how to promote, how to use social media, all things that are not naturally farming. Um, so my son finds himself multitasking, raising animals, uh, looking after fields, hedgerows and stuff. I'm also trying to repair buildings in one way or another and get the produce sold that, that we're managing to produce. Um, in 10 years, um, I think I've probably disposed of all the assets of my mother, mum and dad my own um, uh, capital from the London house, various other little inheritances, um, and, um, and then about 10 years of working as, a, as an energy consultant while I was trying to help the farm get going. So we put in quite a bit of effort, and finally I think the farm has stopped costing me money. It will never pay it back. Not me, anyway. But we do have six people working. Three of them, oh, sorry, two of them are involved with a wedding barn as diversification. That wedding barn, in two years, managed to eclipse the income from the farm. Um, so it was all looking quite sweet until COVID. <laughs> But so, you know, there we are at the moment trying to um, uh, produce some food for local people. We've got quite a customer list now. And um, as I say, it's, it's, it's started to pay its own way. It's not hugely profit making. And on the farm, there are six of us working and three of us get paid. Um, all about people is what they're supposed to be, and, and, and there were guidelines as to what we do to manage people and, and um, um, motivate people. Motivation is interesting. Everybody sees through our billing system what's being earned. Not everybody would do that, but we do, so everybody can see what they're doing and how it's contributing. And so we have little monthly targets to try and beat the same month last year, you know. The difficulty, of course, recently is that if your costs are going up faster than your sales, uh, you s quickly can overrun your, your profit margin. And um, the pigs have been a particular problem because, of course, they are dependent on uh, bringing in feed. That feed has doubled in price. 
uh, our electricity, which is quite significant because we've got various chilling units and, and two houses to run and various things. Um, that is uh, a real concern. And, and then there's a the cost of fuel, of course. So, you know, I'm running out of time. Okay, good. Well, there we are. Um, I haven't mentioned wildlife, which is an increasingly important part of our, 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 our um, farmstead. Uh, we are very fortunately located near the beach, near a beach, near the coast, coast path. And on our farm, like many farms, there is a huge amount of heritage. You know, there's mining heritage, there's natural heritage, there's archaeological heritage. Uh, there's the full history of, of, of farming going back to when it started. And, and that is something that I think we can make something of. After all, we do have a little car park and a little fee to charge there. So that's, that's me. James Richards. Afternoon, everyone. Um, James Richards, farming uh, around Carnbrae, Four Lanes area, um, in partnership with my mum and dad and brother. We are running uh, sort of 100 suckler cows, uh, rearing young stock off them, and a contractor business. So I sort of guess that's where we uh, diversified that way as extra. Um, yeah, basically, I was an engineer when I well went left school, college days at Dutchy, and then did an apprenticeship with Troy Tractors. So I was there for five years, and then my passion really was home on the farm. So I did go travelling to New Zealand in 08, um, and then I came back 2009 and uh, wanted to come home. So uh, that's sort of that was the idea of what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, ba basically, we th there's obviously dad, brother, and myself mainly doing the contracting, but we got a couple of self-employed chaps that come in and help out as and when needed. So we're pretty fortunate that way. Um, but we try and keep everything now as much as we can. Um, yeah, my, mine's quite a bit shorter than anyone else's, really. Um, I don't yeah. want to think. So in terms of those staff that you've got, or, or trying to manage your own time. In terms of, I know that when I speak to many farmers, those that have younger people, and once you get your own children and you're contracting, it's how do you manage that contracting time and managing your farm, and, and also do you have time left for your family? Yeah, well, um, obviously I've got a little one as well, so um, it's difficult summertime because of grass harvest and whatever, you can't uh, guarantee to have a Sunday off or whatever, so it's kind of a bit of a juggling act, really. Um, and we also think about the people that help us out. They've got a lifestyle as well. So, you know, if they want to go out that evening, we've got to try and work around that. Really, you can't expect, you know, it's, it's our business, it's our passion, if you know what I mean. They, if you don't look after them, they're not going to look after you in the long and short of it, really. So, um, yeah, treat them best we can. But winter time is a bit quieter time, I guess, really, other than the stock. So, um, yeah, we try and have, like, sort of a quietish Sunday afternoon if we can just to yeah you, family time is important time really and a bit, you know a bit of uh, time for yourself and yeah mentally as much as anything else I think really otherwise we're all guilty especially if you live on the farm you live at work so it's easy to pop in and then oh, I could go out and do this a minute and then next minute three four hours later before you come back in and you probably have ear chewing of where you've been <laughs> So yeah, no, you've definitely got to make time for it, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, can I have a mic? Yeah. Well, I'm going to stand up, I think, because um, I can see who's going to sleep then. Um, so all about, <coughs> all about people. Um, you know, I think that's a great title, really, because, you know, whether it's life um, or, or our individual businesses, our family farms, our, our businesses, it's all about people. Um, I've been a member of uh, various uh, grazing or livestock discussion groups for 25 years now. And usually when we go onto a farm, we discuss things in terms of cows, uh, grass and people. And um, I've seen cows done pretty badly and I've seen grass done pretty averagely. But if people are done either averagely or badly, then that business um, 
is on the back foot and it, and it struggles and it really doesn't go forward very well at all. So we've got to get people right. And when, when a business grows, um, it becomes even more important. Now, whether, you know, there's very few, um, you know, sole um, operators nowadays. You know, it's usually, a, you know, it's either a family business where there'll be more than one person involved um, or, or a larger business with a larger number of people. Um, and the principles are always the same. Um, so a brief history from me. Um, as, as Chris alluded to there, um, I'm a, a father, I farmed uh, w with my father. I, I, I studied um, seal haying uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Came back to the family farm, which was uh, basically about uh, 250 acres. Um, and we milked about 100 cows. Dad had a small uh, silage contracting business at the time. And basically had two full-time staff, uh, two part-time staff, uh, YTS student, um, and, and a lot of that would have been, would have facilitated him being off farm. Uh, he was involved with various things off farm. Um, when I came back, I was probably the grim reaper, really, because I got rid of, uh, well, the, the two, the two part-time were my, my granddad and my uncle who, who were retired, who then retired, they were retirement age, but the two full-time, um, we made redundant and, and basically me and dad and a relief milker, uh, took on the, the work side of it. Did that for many years. Uh, we grew the herd, probably got up to around 200, 220 on that kind of system where it was just me and dad um, and, and, and a relief milker. And you know, it, it worked really well because me and dad were kind of um, telepathic, really. We, we kind of knew between us. We didn't really need systems of uh, protocols, etc., that I have to try and do nowadays because we, we just intuitively knew what was to be done and, and, and did it. Um, but, you know, sadly, Dad, Dad passed away quite uh, suddenly and unexpectedly back in 2018. And, um, you know, things obviously changed uh, overnight for us in terms of people and the farm. Um, now, the spring of 2019 was quite tough, quite wet. We, we, we carve all the cows, so the vast majority of the cows in the spring. By this stage, we got up to 300 cows. Um, and I remember, Rachel, remember the day we were, we were up to our eyes in it, really. And, um, you know, she said, oh, I think a load of yearlings got out somewhere. And she said, I think, I think we've got to change here. We've got to try and do something differently, people-wise. So I set about um, putting, like, a, a different team together, really, to manage, to manage the farm, to manage the business. Um, and so basically, today, as we speak, we have, on, on the farm side of it, um, we've got two, two full-time staff. Um, and five part-time, uh, plus me. <laughs> so it's quite a few people, and I think that's potentially the way um, that we have to look at um, employing people uh, in this day and age. Um, the uh, the work-life balance thing, I think, is really... It's, a, it's one of those kind of phrases that's very easy to say... We all know that we want to achieve it. We don't really know what it is, but we're kind of mindful of when it's not right. And what, what I'm really kind of keen to see is that as an employer, I can help those employees to share in that kind of um, philosophy so that they too can achieve some form of, of, of balance between what the amount of time they spend each week um, working and the amount of time that they spend with, with an option of what they do with that time. Um, I mean, I think, it, you know, we see a lot on, online nowadays of adverts for jobs, etc. And um, th there was one recently that, that advertised a dairy job as, um, you know, wonderful facilities, lovely house, etc., wonderful pay, I'd imagine. But it was basically... Um, the, the milking time start time was kind of 3.30 a.m. And the evening milking would finish about 7.30 p.m. And you were expected to do 11 milkings a week, which doesn't sound too bad. But I think that kind of traditional mentality of expecting someone to be turning up for work, ready to work at 3.30 a.m. Um, it, it is going to be nigh on impossible in, in the future. So um, what have I done to to try and make this work for them as, as much as me. We, 
We actually did three years of milking the cows once a day. Uh, I uh, knew lots of uh, colleagues that were milking once, cows once a day, was obviously attracted to it socially because, um, you know, you take away that um, necessity to, to start the, the dairy day early and, and finish it later. And um, it worked. You know, we did, you know, the year after Dad, Dad passed away for, for three years, we did, we, we did once a day. It, it definitely worked. But we found that we were milking uh, more cows to try, and, to try and get it to kind of balance, um, putting a bit more pressure on the facilities, etc. And then last, uh, well, about 18 months ago, I became aware of a system where, uh, particularly done in New Zealand, where cows are milked 10 times a week. Um, so that's what we had to go at this year, and I've been absolutely delighted with it. And you know, I'd be quite confident you'd ask my staff if they've been happy with it as well. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they would say yes, because it, it just, you know, we're talking about the word balance here. And, you know, the balance between milking cows uh, twice a day, every day of the year, or once a day, every day of the year, for me, it is milking them 10 times a week. Um, and if anybody wants to kind of quiz me on that afterwards, because this isn't about milking systems, but if anybody wants to quiz me on how that works in reality, please, please do. But the, we've actually produced as much milk solids per cow this year by milking them 10 times a week as we did the last year. We milked them twice a day. So huge potential in that system. And one, one of the things around that system, and the Kiwis uh, are, are big on this, is that it's weekend-centric. So weekend-centric, you know... My, the team at the minute is average age of about 23. And um, they are keen on their weekends. <laughs> so to get them out of bed early on a Saturday or a Sunday morning it, it is obviously a challenge. So with the 10 in 7 milking system, we, we milk at kind of 9.30 a.m. on a Saturday and 7.30 a.m. on a Sunday. So we, by default then, we've got this system that's more more attractive. Um, we do a system where we have uh, a weekend on, weekend off for, 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 for all members of the team. Um, and on your weekend on, um, there'll be no afternoon work. So the weekend on is, is only um, kind of Saturday and Sunday morning. And the weekend off obviously is, is the whole Saturday and Sunday off. So again, quite attractive kind of s system situation. Um, the other thing I've made a note of is, is just to have sensible working hours. So I think, you know, especially with dairy, it's really difficult to create those sensible working hours. But even in a twice a day system, it's possible by having, you know, one team to do the morning shift and, and another team to do the afternoon shift. But that still requires lots of different people. And I think that's what we've got to get our heads around. You know, when you employ a number of people, you need more than you think. You know, time people have holiday, illness, um, you know, they, they, the number of people you physically need is, is, is quite a few. Um, and I think the other note I've made here is around, like, the, so the total package for, for, for someone that, 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 works, that works for us. Um, I mean, we have an annual review uh, with the staff, and it's really interesting that when you say to them, well, look, what, what are the issues? You know, what are you happy with? What are you unhappy with? It's not the obvious one. It's not, you don't pay me enough and I work too many hours. You know, that's very rarely the scenario. It's more, um, you know, what are the facilities like that I'm expected to operate with? Um, you know, how, how modern is the equipment? You know, is it well maintained and serviced? Um, you know, that, that time off thing, you know, you know, for years and years, we employed, you, you know, people that never take their four weeks allowance, you know, and nowadays they do. And I'm glad they do. I want them to. It's really important that they do. So, so you've got to factor all this in. Um, so the other things that we offer, um, training, you know, really important that there are, if there are opportunities, there's loads of stuff they can go on. Do they want to be a member of a discussion group? I've been a huge fan of that. Like I say, all my work in life, I think that the staff need to be in discussion groups as well. Uh, we have an annual party. We have, um, Rachel calls it payday pasties. So the last working day of the month, we often get them pasties and you know, all sit together um, and just have a you know, hour or so 
you know, as a team, and you know, just little things like that, you know, make 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 big differences. Um, the other thing we've done is put two two people in the parlour pit, and you know, for you, we put in a modern parlour, and you know, it's easy to convince yourself that you've invested in the parlour, therefore. One person can do that, which one person can, it's possible, but it's much more rewarding and it's something I've taken as a response from them that if there's two of them there, that they enjoy it more. And they are actually more efficient. You know, we, we can milk the cows more efficiently with two. So all, all these things, sometimes I think you've got to listen to, to, to what, what, they're, what they want as much as what you want. And, and I, I've just made a note that that their, their work-life balance is, is as important, it's actually probably more important than mine. Because if, if they don't feel comfortable and happy to come to work and want to come to work, um, then, it, then it's gonna, gonna flounder. I'll leave it there. Okay. So, uh, I'm conscious of time, but questions from the floor, please? Lisa, Lisa. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's, a, it's a question for Chris. Um, so I think this session, as um, you've all you know, said, it's all about people. It's really, really important um, for the productivity of the farm, the general well-being, the mental health of everybody. Um, I'm just curious because I also think it's about all about the animals as well as the land. And I'm just curious whether you feel cows get a sense of time out as well at the weekend. <laughs> They get out at weekends. I don't know about time out. Um, do the cows... I mean, the cows... Um, yeah, cows are a creature of habit, a bit like we are. They love that routine, don't they? And, and I know when I started this variable milking time system that I had to work with them a bit to understand what they, how they worked so as I could make it work for us. And the classic for that was that initially I wasn't allocating enough grass for them at night on the morning when we milk later so uh, on the Tuesday and Thursday we milk later in the morning and um, you know from first light until kind of nine half past nine when we got them in they were at the gate because they thought it was milking time so I had to learn to allocate extra feed extra grass for them on that long on the long night as I call it so as they they had grass to go at from first light so little things like that make a difference, um, but they adapt, and and they, and they, yeah. they they get used to it. So, yeah. yeah, we're like Chris. We're we're once a day, and I've been for for a number of years. Um, I think one of the points that came up this morning was about um, we need to learn, uh, or or we need to go backwards and adopt old skills. I think the skills we can learn. I don't know about you, Chris. I think um, a lot of these. I call sort of once a day quite a big change compared to where we were. It's mindset um, because we we did all the three times a day milking. We 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 we've done it all over the years, um, but to change to to go to you know like we were saying there earlier on less is more. I think it's 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 a it's a mindset as much as anything, and uh, not everybody can do that mindset. But I think it's probably one that if we take advantage of, it's it's it reaps its rewards. Yeah. Can I add on that? When I am asked to go to a farm, sometimes I would say to myself when I'm walking around the dairy, for example, would I like to be a cow here? And sometimes I don't. You know, the lighting is poor, it's filthy, you know, there's plastic everywhere. It is not a good impression. And, and you, if it was a nicer place to work, the cows would be in a better condition and everything would be running better. And I think there is looking at how they looked after would enable you to be look, you would work in better conditions yourself anybody else um tom i think you had a question Did yeah sorry it's a bit chris centric are you as vi are you more viable in the 10 times a day do you think you were the one you were on the once today? day it's sort of 10 times a week is, is it is it financially paid off as well as emotionally yeah 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 definitely i think um there's so, there's so many things that are interacting at the minute, isn't it? I mean, obviously, we're talking about people here, and it's, and it's, it's got a lot of the attraction of once a day is, is still there, um, because obviously, it's only three days a week we milk twice. 
Um, profitability wise, I would say um, it's like anything. It's you know, it's how it's how well you do it. Um, I mean, last year, uh, obviously, you know, was, was a very good year f for for us in terms of you know getting the extra production in a year when the milk price was very good. Um, but I just don't, I think the the other thing that's kind of coming down the track at us is this whole sustainability thing. So when I started doing my kind of carbon audit, um, and this probably leads into what going to be talking about next is that basically um, the once a day system is is being hit hard you know on the on the kind of methane front kind of the dilution factor isn't there because the output's um, relatively low per cow um, so I was coming off quite badly in terms of the score whereas with the extra production you know with the twice a day production that we've gone back to but only doing 10 times a week you know so we're saving electric we're saving um, chemical, washout, heating water, all that kind of thing, you know, that's all helping to keep it more sustainable. Oh, excuse me. You're all employing staff, and I think three out of the four are employing part-time staff. Is that by choice, or is that because you're forced to employ part-time staff because they don't want to be committed to your business full-time, or they like the variety, mm -hmm. or that's all James. Personally, for ourselves, um, we've struggled to keep them working all year round with the contracting side because the cattle management and all is just, to, you know, that's they don't really touch the cattle much, really. It's more the contracting that we've got them for personally, and our busiest time is over the summer when we're bailing, to be honest, but for ourselves anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Mervyn last counted his hours at over 80 hours a week. Um, and doesn't get a huge amount of pay for that. But then he is the farmer. Um, we employ one person full time on just above minimum wage. He's very pleased to be doing it and he has a lot of freedom with the things we do and how he can develop what we do. So I think there's, there's a bit of to and fro in there, but we couldn't possibly afford to pay, you know, a decent wage that would enable somebody to buy a house, for instance. And then we have a couple of other people who find it convenient to work with us when it suits them. Um, particularly on the, uh, the wedding barn side, we've got sometimes on a weekend, we've got 12 people there. And uh, they're, they're doing a, a shift um, uh, one, one, one day a week. Um, so it's a real mixture. Um, but Overall, there's no way that we're paying a decent wage. I think I could add to that in that we have just taken on two extra part-time staff within Farm Cornwall. And I think I found that to some extent you had 100% to attend to my job before. Now, although I've got more staff, I have to allocate some of my time to the management of those staff, which probably wasn't happening before. Any anyway, Chris, you were... Yeah, um, we've... Uh, well, it's slightly different, two, two sides of the business. So the farm side is just myself and a relief milker, and uh, we're up once a day as well. Uh, and she really likes the, the once a day milking, because it then gives her the rest of the day. She's got a small hole in her own, or she goes off and drives her contractor or, or whatever. So that she finds the once a day really fits for her, uh, and I do the rest. Um, on the kennels side, we run a full, full timer, uh, or which only two full timers, and one of those may may be at, that, at certain times be a be a student um, as well, because um, we've always tried to encourage uh, youngsters through through that way as well. Um, but then on top of that, most of our part timers are young la um, young girls normally, um, but young school leavers because our peak time is school holiday times or, or weekends so that we can give the full-timers some weekend time off. So we tend to use um, some you know, local um, school leavers or, or, or school age for, for those times because in fact some of those have stayed with us then and, and go on to be the students, so it, it works. But um, it has, the market has changed in that when we started, um, we were using um, local farm kids 
you know, uh, on the doorstep. Because it didn't matter if it was Tinsel Ball the night before. They would turn up the next morning, even if they were throwing up in the corner. They would still be there. Um, but now we, we, we've got less, less rural kids uh, and we're having to go into the sort of more urban um, uh, levers and some of those don't quite have the same ethics as, as, as the farm kids do. But it's, it's, it's just the way we've got to adapt them and it's like Chris said, we, we've got to change to work with them more because that, that's where the marketplace is uh, and yeah, we've got to pay them. Um, the, the old days of trying to get them cheap is, is gone, I'm afraid. For it, is, it has an error anyway. I think the way I look at it, Julian, is like it's that combination of the two. So, like on the dairy farm, there's like an amount of work that's there all year round that the full time to kind of mop up, or between them and me. And then there's this there's these kind of peaks of work. Um, you know, whether it be the carving, uh, silage, um, you know, um, AI, I suppose. You know, there's there's stuff that's um, like I say, a peak of work, and then the and the milking, you know. So basically, then the the part timers um, come in and do the do the peaks. Really, that's the way I look at it. Well, right, okay. Um, just you, you were talking about the people all the way through. I'm <coughs> just wondering if uh, do you feel you will have enough time off? Um, you know, it's, it's all your own businesses, so it's a case of you know, do you feel you've got you have enough time off yourself? Could have a quick. Answer to those, please. I think it gets easier as you get older because uh, you look at life slightly different. Um, when you've got young kids uh, uh, and you're, you're driving the business as well, spare time it, it doesn't come that easily. But as you get older, you, you actually realise that you need to sit back a little bit because this, this isn't, you know, this isn't a trial run. This is the only run we get, uh, and the more you make out of it, the better it is. So. I don't really hold my hands up. I probably spend more quality time with the grandkids than I did my own kids. Um, but that's just how life pans out for, for some of us, especially in this industry. James. Yeah, I think, yeah, probably don't don't spend enough time, if I'm honest, you know, off the farm. It's sort of, you get tied to it. But, um, yeah, definitely make sure I sort of have a, a week away with, with the family and grab every minute I can do, if you know what I mean. But trouble is, summertime when it's nice time we're busy so it's sort of a bit of a if i get a ca get a catchy weekend or something then it might just be something as simple as just grab the caravan and just go somewhere locally just just as a break like especially now having a young family it certainly altered how i look at it because i before i was just quite happy work 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 and see the missus in the evening or whatever but yeah de definitely try i try my best to spend a bit of time with the family, really, if I can. Chris, quickly. Yeah, yeah qu quickly. I'm just having the glare from my wife down in front of me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, an the answer can only be no, can it? Because obviously, I mean. <laughs> right. Ian, quickly. Yeah, yeah ju just quickly. I, before I came down here, I was playing rugby twice a week, training once a week, fishing twice a week. Um, that all stopped when I came here to, to look after a farm. Um, and I'm now five, year, five years past technical retiring age, and I'm still working pretty much full time. Although I do get now to go fishing once a week. Right, okay. Right. Well, I'd like to thank our team um, for what they said. There's some really thought-provoking and, and, and almost emotional points of view that they've made, and so thank you very much. And appreciate <laughs>